small town America. But underneath it might not be as wholesome as it looks. Well then why did you marry him? I didn't. And he didn't marry me because he already had a wife. I will tell, I will tell, I will tell, I'll tell him. You told me Parkman was your hometown. Isn't it? Yeah. Used to be. The movie trope of the small town with secrets, surprisingly, has its birth in 1942 in the fictional small Midwestern town named King's Row. Released a few months after Pearl Harbor and starring Anne Sheridan, Robert Cummings, and Ronald Reagan with all-star support from Claude Rains, Charles Coburn, and Judith Anderson, King's Row is a movie that unearths the dark and seedy undercurrent of small town life. It lifts the veil off of the charade of respectability to reveal hypocrisy, perversion, corruption, and familial dysfunction. Critic Emmanuel Levy notes that, like Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt made the same year, King's Row addresses the issue of the duplicity of human nature. What is different, however, is the film's style, which is pure Hollywood melodrama. The fact that this film was even produced is amazing in its own right. The enforcement of the production code in 1934 made it nearly impossible to produce films that criticized the fundamental idea of the American way of life. Criticism could be made of certain features of the small town. Alice Adams was a criticism of small town class snobbery. And both Fury and They Won't Forget are obvious indictments of small town mob violence. You're the ones who stirred up all the hatred and prejudice down here, just like Gleason and his crowd stirred it up north. And for no other reason than it suited your ambition. But a film that had at its core a small town rotted with deep-rooted corruption and perversion was absolutely unheard of. And King's Row is that film. Did you read King's Row? I never read such a fascinating story. Based on a popular and well-read novel of the time by Henry Bellamin, King's Row was based on Bellamin's fictionalized experience growing up in Fulton, Missouri. And let's just say at times, he didn't even bother to change the street names. Robert Cummings plays Paris Mitchell, and he's not your average small town all-American hero. He's definitely no Andy Hardy. He's sensitive, he speaks French and German, and is being raised by his grandmother, who is of some non-specific European extraction. Paris plays the piano. Your tone is thin. He's polite to his elders. But he's the only young man in town beside Paris Mitchell who has grace enough to say sir to his elders. <laughs> well read, and his future includes medical school in Vienna. He's also in love with Cassandra Tower, daughter of one of the town's two doctors. Cassandra and Paris are playmates, and as youngsters, they have a mutual youthful crush on each other. But after her birthday party, a party upstaged by Louise Gordon's party, Dr. Tower removes Cassie from school and locks her away in the house, just like her mother, who the town says is crazy. Just the same, there is something queer about those towers. A doctor who says he's a doctor, but never has a patient, and his wife who stays in that upstairs room all the time, gives a person the creeps. Drake McHugh, Ronald Reagan, in what is considered his best movie role, is Paris's best friend and the town's late 19th century equivalent of a bad boy. Like Paris, he's an orphan and lives with his Aunt Mamie. Drake likes girls and buggy riding. A lot of buggy riding. His heart belongs to Louise Gordon, but since he's buggy riding all over town with other girls, Louise's father, Doc Gordon, the other doctor in town, and Mrs. Gordon, who are very strong, fanatical religious types, have said that's a no. Then there's Randy Monahan. She lives across the railway tracks. Well, basically next door to them. As a youth, she's a tomboy, but as she grows up, she blossoms into a beauty, and she catches Drake's eye once Louise is out of reach. I have my buggy down here. How about coming for a ride out in the country? And a lot of things happen as our five young people grow up, and none of it is good, clean, or wholesome. The movie Subversion of the American Small Town is a first. Here was a film where the town doctors were sadists and murderers. Dr. Tower murders Cassie and then kills himself, and Dr. Gordon cuts off Drake's legs in an unnecessary operation. Where's the rest of me? 
The bank managers are thieves. The bank president absconds to Mexico with all of the money of some of the town's wealthiest residents, including Drake's inheritance. And the upper classes are explicitly and dangerously elitist and small-minded and gossipy. And in a very open way, everyone talks about class. It informs each relationship and the major choices the characters make. A boy who belongs uptown starts taking a girl from the lower end of town out buggy riding at night. People talk. The book touched on all these themes and did so much more explicitly. In fact, some parts were so explicit that screenwriter Casey Robinson had to just cut them out altogether. Under the direction of production designer William Cameron Menzies, Warner Brothers constructed the exterior of the town King's Row on a back lot. A constructed place that illustrated in its architecture and layout its ingrained social divide. But on the surface, one can understand its appeal. From its tree-lined streets, picturesque schoolhouse, its natural surroundings. On the outside, it does seem like a good, clean place, a good place to raise children. The houses uptown on Union Street are large and spacious with maids and finely appointed parlors, but they also appear foreboding in their Victorian Gothic revival styling, a warning of the danger that exists on the other side of the door. Because behind those doors is a place of oppression, abuse, and imprisonment, where insane mothers peek out from behind windows it's a place where Louise, who challenges her father's sadism, is abused and imprisoned. And Cassie, who embodies all his fears of hereditary madness, is hidden away by her cruel and domineering father. In the book, Cassie's fate is even darker. She is still murdered by her father, but she was also a victim of sexual abuse at his hands. And then there's downtown, where the railway tracks run right down the middle of the neighborhood, where the depot, the ice house, and the saloon are located. And this is where Drake goes after all his money is stolen. He leaves uptown for downtown. Destitute, he takes a job at the railway depot and suffers the accident that gives Dr. Gordon the pretext to remove his legs. This is a lot for three months after Pearl Harbor. And this is dark. This movie's dark, really dark. Some critics at the time were a bit rough on the film, calling it overwrought melodrama. New York Times film critic Bosley Crowther called it gloomy and ponderous, further stating that the original novel was a bit too thick for the screen, being a comprehensive story of several sordid and perverse folk living in a queer Midwestern city. But others, like critic David Platt of The Daily Worker, went so far as to praise King's Row as the first penetrating psychological study of small town life. He went further and called it far superior in imagination and more honest in treatment than Thornton Wilder's pussyfooting Our Town. Although released in a year that included such classics as Mrs. Miniver, Now Voyager, and Casablanca, King's Row was still a hit, bringing in around $2 million at the box office. The movie was nominated for three Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Director for Sam Wood, and Best Black and White Photography for James Wong Howe. It lost all three. But even now, over 80 years later, King's Row remains devastating and subversive in the ways in which it tackles its subject matter. Its exploration of the dark side and duplicity of human nature and the underbelly of the facade of respectability was groundbreaking. And it wouldn't be until the 1950s that such a critical eye was turned back onto small town American life. There are eight million stories in the cinema cities. This has been one. Hey fellow cinema travelers, let me know down in the comments if you've seen this one, or Peyton Place, or any of the other small town with a secret movies, or if you've got your own favorites. I'll see you in the next city.